Guys, you have no idea how warm it is in my room and with all the lights and stuff. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Victoria. Welcome back to my channel. It's finally time for a new wrap up. I'm gonna show you all the books that I read in July. It wasn't that many and I thought about, okay, maybe I'm just gonna combine the ones that I read in July with the ones in August. But I recently found myself thinking that maybe showing oh, you have to read this amount of books to make it into a wrap-up is not the best thing because we always need to remind ourselves that reading is not about quantity, but about quality. And I find myself always wanting to read more and then being disappointed when at the end of the month I didn't read eight books. But, you know, that's what happens when you live. <laughs> So I think I read five books, two of them were plays, so I want to say this video will be shorter But if you've been here for a while, you know that that's most likely not the case <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna start right away because you know me, you know that I like to talk Okay, so the first book I read this month was actually a play and I technically did not read it But I watched it performed or watched it being performed, so I'm gonna count it Othello by William Shakespeare. I'm slowly making my way through all his plays and Othello was a very special experience because we actually, or I actually watched it live with my sister, with one of my sisters. Clara and I got tickets. That was in the beginning of the month and my mom sent me this post on Instagram that an English theater group would make like a castle tour. So they are performing the play in a bunch of castles and they performed in Schloss Hohenschwango or a castle Hohenschwango. And I was so excited. It was so much fun. It was so beautiful. The atmosphere was gorgeous. I have some pictures that aren't the best, but I'm gonna insert them here. I loved it. That was one of the most special and one of the most incredible nights. Let's talk about Othello. So maybe I can, maybe the summary is better than my summary. In Othello, Shakespeare creates powerful drama from a marriage between the exotic Moor Othello and the Venetian. Is it Venetian? I'm sorry, Lady Desdemona that begins with elopement and mutual devotion and ends with jealous rage and death. Shakespeare builds many differences into his hero and heroine, heroine, I can't ever say that, <laughs> including race, age and cultural background. Yet most readers and audiences believe the couple's strong love would overcome these differences were it not for Iago, who sets out to destroy Othello. Iago's false insinuations about Desdemona's infidelity draw Othello into his schemes and Desdemona is subjected to Othello's horrifying verbal and physical assaults. The play was so sad because you have these two incredible people, Othello and Desdemona, and they love each other so much and the actors portray their love in such a beautiful way and you really got that they loved each other. But one word from Iago saying, Desdemona is unfaithful, she's having an affair with someone, just broke everything. And that is so sad. So Iago is the villain of the story, but I loved it. It was great. I want to see this play again on a website where I always watch plays because it was definitely a shorter version of the whole play because when I watch Globe Theatre performances, they are almost like three hours long. And this was like two hours barely two hours, I think, because it was outside, it was beginning to get cold. I loved Othello. It was tragic, it was sad, it was funny, it was beautiful, and I definitely need to have a full copy of it because I have a full collection of Shakespeare, but I, I, I want <laughs> every single play on its own, uh, so yeah, I need to get it. The reason why I'm putting plays in here as well that I actually watched and not technically read is because you hear it, so it's basically an audiobook, and you see the play the way it's supposed to be seen, performed. So, I think it's the best of both worlds. <laughs> I give Othello four stars, or five. I don't know, I, it's a different scale when it comes to Shakespeare and plays. <laughs> okay. The next book I read was How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey. A book that has been making its way through booktube and book talk, uh, like I think last year, and then it kind of vanished, but it was available on BookBeat, so I listened to that. And I'm gonna just read you the summary because it's easier that way. I have killed several people, some brutally, others calmly, and yet I currently languish in jail for a murder I did not commit. When I think about what I actually did, I feel somewhat sad that nobody will ever know about the complex operation that I undertook. Getting away with it is highly preferable, of course, but perhaps when I'm long gone, someone will open an old safe and find this confession. 
the public would reel. After all, almost nobody else in the world can possibly understand how someone by the tender age of 28 can have calmly killed six members of her family and then happily gone on with the rest of her life, never to regret a thing. That is the summary of the book. It's not a guide on how to kill your family. It's just Grace's story. Is her name Grace? I don't know, I feel like July was such a long month because I, I had COVID and I, I had finals. So that I can't really remember stuff. No, but um, Grace did kill members of her family. And though I gotta say extended family. She was abandoned by her real family. And then I think she was adopted and now wants to get revenge because of course her family or the extended family is very rich and she is not technically poor and she's making her way in the world and she's doing fine, but all to serve a greater goal or to a greater good because she wants to kill her family and that's what she does. So she's writing this confession letter while she's in jail, um, telling you all about the murders, how she committed them and what happened and also what happened after. And it was a good book. It was definitely one I liked listening to. I always have these books where I feel like, okay, I definitely want to have this as a physical copy and I definitely want to read it. This was not one of those books. I was really happy with the audiobook. I thought it was great. I think it had even multiple uh, readers. So that was awesome. And yeah, I really liked listening to it. My stars, I think it was 3.75. It was a solid read or solid listen. It's not your typical crime story or thriller. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that because the way that she talks about these murders is just very like simple and easy and, and not very emotional. So you could say that she's kind of a cold person. I think you gotta be if you wanna kill people. I don't know, I never killed someone. I think it's very interesting. It's not your typical thriller. You don't get this rush of, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? Oh my God. I didn't find myself thinking that, but it was still a good, a good and exciting book to find out how she committed these crimes, how she got away with it and what happened afterwards. You dive into a very unique mind when you read this book. I can, I can really appreciate the book for that because Grace really is a very interesting and unique character. One I have not encountered before, I think. But that's beautiful and I think that's great. So yeah, character-wise, I think it was amazing. Plot-wise, I thought it was interesting because we jump in time, we have Grace writing this letter, we have her in the future, in the present, in the past, and that was good. I did not find myself being very confused by that, and sometimes it happens when a book jumps in time. <laughs> because when you listen to a book and you don't know where you are, so time-wise, you can't really go back and say, where am I right now? So that's always a bit of an issue with audiobooks that tell a story that has different timelines. But in this book, I thought it was pretty clear and I was able to understand everything. Okay, <laughs> next book. Um, the next one was again, a play, of course. I watched Much Ado About Nothing one night because I really wanted to. I'm gonna read you the summary. Much Ado About Nothing includes two quite different stories of romantic love. Hero and Claudio fall in love almost at first sight, but an outsider, Don John, strikes out at their happiness. Beatrice and Benedict are kept apart by pride and mutual antagonism until others decide to play Cupid. As the summary indicated, we have two kinds of love story. One of them is like a love at first sight and the other one is an enemies to lovers, which was really fun to watch. So on the one hand, you have a love that is so pure and so beautiful, but then someone lies or misunderstood something and it seems like everything is going down the drain. <laughs> seems like everything is lost. I'm not gonna spoil you what happens at the end, but it's a comedy, so it's not a tragedy, just for your information. And on the other hand, we have Benedict and Beatrice who at the beginning of the play proclaim that they were never gonna fall in love. Benedict is going to be a bachelor for the rest of his life, that um, he enjoys his life that way. They just hate each other, they bicker all the time. And you would never think that these two would ever be together. But of course that's the tension and the, you know, thrill when it comes to enemies to lovers. The other characters pick up on it and then they're like, you know what? They're always saying that they hate each other, but secretly they love each other. So let's, as the summary says, play Cupid. Let's get them together. And that is so fun to watch. I really like this play. I did laugh a lot. I did not laugh as much as I did when I watched Twelfth Night. So I think comedy wise, I would say Twelfth Night is a bit funnier, but a bit, it depends on the performance. But the performance I watched was 
amazing. I loved it. It was so good. This time I watched it on the website. <laughs> it was amazing. I love it. I love watching Shakespeare plays. And if you want to get to know Shakespeare or if you want to experience a play, please watch it. If you're a student especially, you can try drama online. That's why I watch all the plays because as a student, I can. It depends on your university, but I would definitely try that. And I bet there are some performances out there on YouTube. So yeah, I highly recommend it. It's so much fun. You can buy some DVDs on globetheater.com. Um, this is my big ass Shakespeare collection. It's gifted to me. And I read much ado about nothing in here. Right here, there it is. I marked a thing, uh, a sentence, which I thought was really, really pretty. So Claudia says in this scene, friendship is constant in all other things, safe in the office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent, for every beauty is a witch against whose charms faith melteth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof which I mistrusted not. Farewell, therefore." So yeah, that was the scene where I think he finds out, or finds out, that just like in Othello, his love was not faithful. But it's a comedy, so it ends well. I loved this. Uh, it was great. Four out of five. Five out of five. I don't really care. <laughs> the next book I read I actually read a physical copy of. I told you about this in my last reading vlog. If you haven't watched it yet, you can click the link in my bio. My last video is always linked in my description box. In my bio, in the description box. Call me by your name, by Andre Essaman. Now, I'm not gonna go into the controversy about the age gap. I think everyone has heard enough who's ever heard of this book. During a restless summer on the Italian Riviera, or Riviera, a powerful romance blooms between 17-year-old Elio and his father's house guest, Oliver. Unrelenting currents of obsession and fear, fascination and desire threaten to overwhelm the lovers who at first feign indifference to the charge between them. What grows from the depths of their souls is a romance of scarcely six weeks duration, duration, and an experience that marks them for a lifetime. For what the two discover on the Riviera, and during a sultry evening in Rome, is the only thing they both already fear they may never truly find again. Total intimacy. This is a very famous book. It's a very famous movie. I do love the movie. It's one of my favorite movies. I said in my reading vlog the entire time that my favorite part of this book was not the love story. Now, this might have been a bit confusing because it is a love story, but my favorite part is just diving into Elio's thoughts, even though sometimes his thoughts and his actions were really weird. <laughs> and I was like, why are you doing this? <laughs> why? You are, you're very unique. But that realization, again, made it so clear how every single person is so different, that every single person, every individual, has their own thoughts and their own minds and their own justification when it comes to their actions. And you really see this in this book. If you want to dive into a character that is in love obsessively and I think for the first time really in his life and deals with that infatuation in ways you might not expect if you have not watched the movie. I would highly recommend this book. I thought the writing was beautiful. I actually read this with two of my friends. We all read a book and then we just send each other the book and then uh, the other can read it and we annotate and mark pages and mine are the green ones. I don't know if you can see it, but I marked a lot. <laughs> I, I really, really loved the writing in this book. I uh, thought it was very special. Some things, even though Elio is such a, a person, <laughs> is just such a different person to me, I was able to relate to some of the things that he said and the way that he articulates his thoughts is so beautiful. So this author can definitely write Though sometimes I was not really fine <laughs> with the description of some of women in this book. So you always feel like that the women are lesser than men or stand lower than men, which, um, yeah, kind of sucked. So that part I didn't like. I'm trying to find a quote that I can read to you. I think this is a good example to show you how Elio thinks about Oliver and his possessions and his own way of, of being in love with him. In years to come, if the book was still in his possession, I wanted him to ache. Better yet, I wanted someone to look through his books one day, open up this tiny volume of Armand's, and ask, tell me who was in silence somewhere in Italy in the mid-80s. 
and then I'd want him to feel something as starting as sorrow and fiercer than regret, maybe even pity for me, because in the bookstore that morning I'd have taken pity too, if pity was all he had to give, if pity could have made him put an arm around me and underneath the surge of pity and regret, hovering like a vague, erotic undercurrent that was years in the making, I wanted him to remember the morning on Monet's berm, when I'd kissed him, not for the first, but the second time, and given him my spit in his mouth, because I so desperately wanted his in mine. This was a longer paragraph than I thought, <laughs> but the, the sentence just didn't end. So the, yes, the sentences are long. Elio, for a 17-year-old, is a very confident guy. In his thoughts, he's very confident. In his actions, he's not. But um, the way that he just thinks and talks is just very much exploration of sexuality, of body, of sex, of intimacy. Um, he's just very in tune with, with himself. With himself. Though I would not argue that he's in tune with everything at all. Because the way that he talks and thinks about Oliver is sometimes very destructive. And you gotta say that their relationship is... Not one or I, w I wouldn't wish it for me that my relationship would be like that because Sometimes it is toxic. So this is where Oliver is and this is where Elio is and you see it You you see it you read it and, and you see it in the way they talk to each other And that was sometimes a bit sad because you thought why does Elio even like this guy? Oliver is not even nice to him. It's interesting. It's not your typical love story. It's it's very Intricate, I would argue. It's sometimes very complex because you're just wondering why. But at the end of the book, that you know that you don't have to ask yourself the question. It's just, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> and you accept it for what it is. And I think that's, that's special. I would definitely say this book is special, but last year at this time, I think I would have had higher expectations. But now I just enjoyed the read and I would give this book a 3.75 stars mostly for the writing because it was beautiful and I will definitely come back to the quotes time and time again. All right, and the last book I read is a short story by Madeline Miller. I also talked about this in my uh, reading vlog and though I finished it on August 1st, I still wanna tell you about it because I started in July. So uh, Galatea is a short story by Madeline Miller as we already talked about. In ancient Greece, a skilled marble sculpture has been blessed by a goddess who has given his masterpiece, the most beautiful woman the town has ever seen, the gift of life. Now his wife, he expects Galatea to please him, to be obedience and humility personified. But she has desires of her own and yearns for independence. In a desperate bid by her obsessive husband to keep her under control, she's locked away under the constant supervision of doctors and nurses. But with a daughter to rescue, Galatea is determined to break free, whatever the cost. This is pretty much a story about domestic violence, domestic abuse, sexual violence, rape, all in all a toxic relationship. So please check the trigger warnings before so these things are discussed in this. Wrapped up in the retelling of a Greek myth. If you're not familiar with the Greek myth or actually it was a story in Ovid's Metamorphosis and he wrote about Pygmalion who is a famous sculptor as we just established. Pygmalion wants this beautiful woman to be his wife. So he falls in love with a freaking statue and then prays to Venus, or in, in Greek mythology, it's Aphrodite, uh, saying, please let her be alive. Please let her come to life. And as we said, this is what happens. And the story does not start there. We don't start with Galatea coming to life. We start with her being in this hospital, being watched 24 seven and experience her pain, experience her experience and strange experiences with her husband while his name is never mentioned. The entire story just calls him my husband or he, him, because it's all in the perspective of Galatea. The reason why I'm saying this is because in Ovid's Metamorphosis, Galatea, so her name, that's her name, is never mentioned. And that reminded me, as I already said in my reading vlog, of Macbeth. His wife is called Lady Macbeth or Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier because the main character is only known as Mrs. De Winter or the, the second Mrs. De Winter, while Rebecca was the first wife of Mr. De Winter. And not naming a character by name strips this character of so much individuality and of power. And Madeline Miller really turned the story around. She really gave Galatea her independence and her power, authority, whatever. Even though objectively she is not independent, 
She is under constant supervision and is being used by her husband. She has zero authority and has zero to say. And when she gets pregnant, so when she has her baby, in the story she already has her baby, but she tells you about how that happened, um, you see Pygmalion being angry that her body changes because he, he crafted her, he wanted her to be perfect and now she's not anymore. It's definitely strange. I thought beautiful because I, I love Greek mythology and I love uh, the myths and stuff. I loved Mela Miller's take on it. The ending was even thrilling. I understood why the author did not make a whole novel about this because she wrote Circe, she wrote Song of Achilles and decided to give Galatea her own story in a short story. Now, I would have waited until a couple years, until I had a collection of maybe three or four short stories in that way and then release it as a collection because this was so expensive and I think there's lots of resources being used for this little thing and I don't think that's necessary. She could have maybe released it online, um, you could even pay for it, but this is a lot for, sh for such a short story. I read this in like an hour. So yeah, definitely not a huge fan of the way that it was published. Um, I'm happy that it was published. As I said, I like the story. Um, I give this four stars. But yeah, I would actually love a short story collection by Madeline Miller because there's so many myths and so many stories and so many uh, legends that I do believe deserve a, a retelling, especially by Madeline Miller because I think she is really good at it, especially making this story more more feministic <laughs> or giving the women power and giving her a voice and giving her a name was a great move. I loved that. So I would love her take on other myths. And I know that she's currently writing her next novel, I think on Persephone and Hades. Really excited for that because um, that story is a complicated one. Complicated meaning when you look at myths, there are so many. <laughs> versions out there and, and trying to find, you know, the right one is almost impossible. And also asking, is there a right one? And this was it. This was my short little wrap up of the books and plays I read and listened to in July. Um, very different things. I'm so excited for August because I'm already reading a great book. I'm listening to two books at the same time. I'm currently listening to Husband Material by Alexis Hall. The second part came out. I'm so excited. I'm listening to Chain of Gold. I told you about this in my reading vlog by Cassandra Clare. And I'm currently reading Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, which I wanted to read for so long. But anyway, these are the books I'm gonna tell you about at the end of August, or rather in the beginning of September. My favorite book this month, my favorite experience with a story was definitely Othello because that night was so special, as I already said, but I think reading Call Me By Your Name was just fun and then finally finishing it and being able to say, yeah, I read this book um, and kind of comparing it to the movie was, was great. And the quotes, as I already said, there are so many that I really, really loved. Yeah. I don't know, I can't really decide. I'm just gonna say Othello because Shakespeare and the experience was amazing. Okay, let me know what your most recent favorite book was, what you're currently reading, what you read in July, what you want to read in August. Just let me know anything that you wanna let me know. I hope you liked it and if you did, please give me a thumbs up and comment down below what you would like to see next. Helps a lot. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet and don't forget to click the little bell next to the subscription button to never miss an upload. Follow me on my Instagram for any updates, for posts, whatever. You can also follow me on my poetry account. All the links to my social media are down below, including links connected to the war. You can educate yourself on the war in Ukraine, or you can even donate to some people uh, that need our help right now. Um, I put some sources down below. And if you have any, put them in the comments. All right, I think this is it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hopefully see you in my next video. Bye! Yeah, it just looked like a second. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Line the quotes. Okay. Ow. What was that? Okay. During a restless summer on the Italian Riviera. 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 He. He. Blah, blah, blah. Italian Riviera. 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 Blah, 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 blah. After all, almost nobody, uh, after all, almost nobody else in the world can possibly understand how someone by the end of... Uh. Okay, this must be enough. Bye. Bye, guys.